Hello everyone, my name is Mara, and today's case is about Lee Achi, who was only 13 years old when she went missing from Tupelo, Mississippi on the day that Hurricane Andrew was moving into the area. Just a quick reminder that I always try to do the best research and get the most accurate information I can for every single case that I cover. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get into today's case. Lee Marine Achi was born on August 21st of 1979 in Honolulu, Hawaii, to her dad, Donald Achi, and her mom, Vicki Felton. Both Donald and Vicki were in the United States Army when they had met. They ended up getting divorced in 1981. At one point, Donald lived in Germany, but he eventually moved to Virginia. And Lee moved with her mom to Tupelo, Mississippi. But her and her dad were still very close, and they kept in close contact with each other. And then Vicky remarried a man who's named Barney Yarborough. He lived in the home with Vicky and Lee until they ended up separating in the beginning of the summer in 1992. But then it was August, and Lee was 13 years old, and she was said to love animals. She had a pet cat and enjoyed riding horses. And even though Lee was excited to be starting 8th grade shortly, she was very shy and had gotten into trouble at school in previous years for shifting her feet and making noises during class. There was a handful of times that Lee went to school with bruises and with black eyes. One of the times that she was asked what was causing these, she said that she got kicked by a horse. And when Vicky was asked what happened, she said that an apple fell from the tree and hit Lee in the face. Lee was said to have a boyfriend around the same age as her, and that one time she called him crying because she said that her stepdad Barney had locked her out. And one of her teachers made the comment that she believed that Lee had a very hard home life. So if Lee got into trouble over something minor at school, teacher wouldn't call Vicky because she didn't want Lee to get into any more trouble and because there was the suspicion of abuse in their home. The night of August 26th of 1992, Lee was over at a neighbor's house. This is when Lee made plans with them that she would be back that Saturday to give their dog a bath, and they told her that they would pay her $5. And as soon as Vicky got home back from work, Lee left to go home. It was said that Vicky went back out that night and that she was seen at a car wash. Then, the next morning of August 27th of 1992, Lee was still in her pajamas as her and Vicky sat and had breakfast. Vicky was reading the newspaper as they discussed the upcoming school year. And Lee was very excited this morning because her grandma was going to come pick her up and bring her to the open house at the middle school. And they had made plans to have Taco Bell for dinner. And around 8 a.m., Vicky leaves to go to work. Since this was one of the last days of summer vacation, Lee stayed at home and waited for her grandma. Lee was very scared of storms, and even that night before, when it was storming, she had slept in her mom's bed. That morning, Vicki had not been at her office long when she heard that a storm relating to Hurricane Andrew was headed towards Tupelo. So sometime before 9 a.m., Vicki tried to call their home phone to get in touch with Lee so she could let her know about the storm that was moving in. But as Vicky's calling their home phone, nobody's answering. Vicky became concerned because the Gulf Coast was under a hurricane alert. So she decided to leave her job and drive the one and a half miles home to check on Lee. As Vicky's pulling in, she notices that their garage door is open, which she finds odd. And the light in the garage is still on, and that only stays on five minutes after the door is activated. So she knew that somebody had to recently open it. Vicky goes into their house and notices that there is wet blood on the wall. When she got to Lee's bedroom, she seen that Lee's favorite blanket was crumpled up on the floor. So she began to search the rooms and yell for Lee. Vicky said she then ran into their backyard to check their pool and their shed. But there still was no sign of Lee or where she was, so she ends up calling 911 around 9 a.m. Once they arrive, she leads them into Lee's bedroom where there is a laundry basket, and in this laundry basket is the nightgown that Lee was wearing that morning, and it's all covered in blood, and there's also one of her bras in there. They also notice a blood trail that led from the hallway to the living room and to the back door. They also seen blood and blonde hair stuck to one of the door frames, so they believed it's possible that Lee hit her head or maybe somebody pushed her head into that door frame. 
and in the master bedroom bathroom, there was evidence that somebody had tried to clean up some of this blood because there still was a pink color left on the counter, but they never were able to find a towel or anything that had all this blood on it. Lee's reading glasses, her shoes, some of her underclothes, and a sleeping bag were missing from her room. But there was no sign of forced entry, and there was nothing else disturbed in the home. So they bring in search dogs and other volunteers. They are able to cover about a half mile radius around the neighborhood. But because of the rain and the wind and the storm starting to get worse, the dogs were not able to pick up any type of scent. Authorities do believe if it wasn't for the bad weather, they probably would have been able to pick up some of Lee's scent. And as soon as the storm passed, they sent out a helicopter. But unfortunately, this did not bring them any closer to finding Lee. And since they weren't having any luck on the outside, they decided to go back to Vicky and Lee's home to search. Police did tell the public that they believed that foul play was involved. But at that time, they did not have any suspects. The Tupelo Police Department went out asking if anybody had seen anything strange that day. No one in the neighborhood said that they seen anything odd, but they did say that they were worried about Hurricane Andrew. And Donald said that Vicky definitely downplayed this. She said, oh, Lee probably just ran away, and that he found out about all the blood and all the extra details from the news. And around two weeks after Lee went missing, he was finally granted leave from the military so he could come down to Mississippi and help look. He stayed in Tupelo for about a month. Then on September 4th, a college student in Boonville, Mississippi, saw a girl that looked a lot like Lee that was going through the McDonald's drive through in a truck with a man. So she called the police and said that she possibly had spotted Lee. But police were able to locate this man and this girl, and it did turn out not to be Lee. And then five days later, on September 9th of 1992, a package was delivered to Vicki and Lee's home. This package was addressed to Vicky's ex, Barney, and inside was Lee's reading glasses that had been missing. But authorities felt as though her glasses were sent as a distraction because there was no ransom note or anything else, and they felt as though if the person who kidnapped her sent these, they would send something more than just her glasses. After this package was sent, this is when the FBI became involved in Lee's case. They did DNA testing on the stamps that were on this package. And when they got the results back, they found out that whoever had sent this package had attached the stamps with water and not saliva. And 14 months after Lee's disappearance, a skull was found in a soybean field. And at first, they did identify it as Lee. But the state's medical examiner office was not using Lee's most recent dental records, and it turned out that it wasn't Lee. So her dad, Donald, passed a polygraph test, and since he was out of state and in the military, he had an alibi about where he was. So almost instantly, he was ruled out being behind Lee's disappearance. They then looked to Barney Yarborough. It was said that Barney did admit to abusing Lee at times, but they said he passed a polygraph test, so he was ruled out as well. And since then, Barney has passed away, so there's very little information about him. And from Vicky's story, she was the last one to see Lee alive that morning. And Vicky failed not one, but three polygraph tests. She also told authorities that this was Lee's first time staying at home alone, which neighbors and everybody else said that that was not true. That there was multiple occasions that Lee was left alone, and she'd go over and talk with neighbors, and just kind of be on her own and doing her own thing. They also mentioned how that day, as soon as authorities arrived after Vicky called 911, they hadn't even really started asking her questions about what Lee was wearing or anything like that. But Vicky suddenly was just naming off all the things that she already knew were missing from Lee's room and naming off all of the clothes that she had been wearing that day. Donald also said he was, of course, just tore up because his little girl that he doesn't get to see that much is missing. But Vicky just seemed very casual. And I know we can all react different to different situations, but it's just odd. I mean, personally, as a mom, I cannot imagine my child being missing. I would be hysterical. But so let's talk about some theories. One is that that night before, when Lee left the neighbors, that maybe 
her and Vicky got into a fight, something happened, and then she went and disposed of the body in the sleeping bag that night. Then woke up that morning, made up the whole story of her and Lee having breakfast and talking about all that. Then she went to work like normal and knew she had to come up with some answers about what happened to Lee and why there was so much blood. Vicky was also a trained interrogator for the U.S. Army, so she was specifically trained on how to act when answering questions. So Donald did believe that Vicky killed Lee the night before, then made up the whole timeline of what happened that morning. There also was a man that they went to church with and who was said to be a friend of Lee's. His name is Oscar McKinley, or he goes by Mike Kearns. He was a Sunday school teacher at the church that Vicki and Lee went to. And this is who Vicki believes kidnapped Lee and killed her. Because nine months after Lee's disappearance, he kidnapped another girl from her home who was in ninth grade and he raped her. But he only served half of his sentence. Then he was released from jail in 1997 when he then kidnapped a couple and raped a woman. So he was convicted in 1999 and it said he passed away at 63 years old in 2021. There hasn't been any more leads and Lee's case has gone cold. So poor Donald has had to sit here and go all these years not knowing what happened to his little girl. And Vicky as well if she truly is innocent and does not know what happened to Lee. And I don't know personally, I just kind of have a bad feeling about the mom and the stepdad. And I have seen so many different people on different sides of, you know, that everybody was just trying to blame Vicky when there was other people that it could have been, which I completely understand. It definitely could have been the neighbor, the church friend. It could have been any of them. But since there was previous abuse and all of that that was going on, maybe her and Vicky got into an argument and it got out of control and Vicky accidentally hit her head on that door frame and she knew the teachers and everybody else that had seen the bruises and all the other stuff were going to accuse her of doing something to Lee. So she panicked, put Lee in that sleeping bag, disposed of her body probably that night before, and then woke up and just acted casual and pretended like they had their normal morning. I don't know though, it's just so sad. There's been so many years that have gone by with no answers and no leads. It says that Lee's case will remain open until her remains are found. Today, she would be 43 years old. But thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you'll like, subscribe, and I will see you all next time. Bye.